Hello and welcome to the Brooklyn Rails. Uh, wait, sorry, got to restart that. <laughs> we can always cut this out in the edit. Um, I wrote the wrong thing in my script. Sorry for being. All right, rewinding. I'm going to start over one more time. Hello and welcome to the Brooklyn Rails 457th New Social Environment. I'm Nick Bennett, the Special Projects Editor here at The Rail, and I have the pleasure and privilege of being your MC today for a conversation featuring Reverend Vivian Nixon, Deanna Hoskins, and Reverend Dr. Donna Scopper. We're thrilled to have The Rail's very own poetry editor, Ansel Berrigan, here to close today's program. A few notes before we get started. The Brooklyn Rail acknowledges that Black Lives Matter and that here in New York, we are, we are on Lenape Hoking, the unceded land and waters of the Wappinger, Canarsie, Muncie, and Lenni Lenape people of the Delaware Nation and Shinnecock Indian Nation. We encourage you to check the chat for a living document of resources and actions that we'll be posting in just a moment. Over the past 21 years, the Brooklyn Rail has undertaken a miraculous journey, bringing together in a singly, single monthly publication, art, music, dance, film, theater, and literature, along with thoughtful social and political meditations. As a small nonprofit, we need your support. This December, we are fundraising $150,000 with just eight days left to meet our campaign goal. Your contribution will directly support our writers, guest artists, production staff, and operations at the rail for the coming year. Please check the chat for more information and links to donate, which we will also be posting in just a moment. But now to introduce today's guests and host, advocate and writer, Reverend Vivian D. Nixon is writer in residence at Columbia Justice Lab Square One Project and recently served as executive director of College and Community Fellowship, an organization that helps women and families most harmed by mass criminal criminalization gain equitable access to opportunity and human rights. Instructed and ordained in the African Methodist Episcopal Church, Reverend Nixon has an MFA from Columbia School of the Arts and currently teaches at Bennington College's, recently teached at Bennington College's Center for the Advancement of Public Action. She is the recipient of the John Jay Medal for Justice and Fellowships with programs at the Aspen Institute, Open Society Foundations, and PEN America. President and CEO of Just Leadership USA, Deanna Hoskins, has been at the helm of the organization since 2018. Prior to this, Ms. Hoskins was at the Department of Justice, where she joined under the Obama administration. And prior to joining the Department of Justice, Ms. Hoskins was the founding director of reentry for Ohio's Hamilton County Board of County Commissioners. Ms. Hoskins is originally from Cincinnati, Cincinnati, Ohio, and holds a master's degree in criminal justice from the University of Cincinnati and a bachelor's of social work from the College of Mount St. Joseph. And last but certainly not least, our Host of the day, community builder Reverend Donna, uh, sorry, Reverend Dr. Donna Scopper served as senior minister of Judson Memorial Church from 2006 to 2021. She was formerly at Coral Gables Congregational Church in Miami and before that at Yale University and teaches leadership at the Hartford Seminary. As an elder, she is passionately concerned about leaving the next generation well prepared for all they have to face. She has written over 35 books, including her most recent, I Heart Francis, Letters to the Pope from an Unlikely Admirer. Uh, she is an editor at large here at The Rail. And Donna, I'm happy to pass the mic over to you. Thank you, Nick. Thank you so much. And hello, everybody. Eight days to go in 2021. And here we are with a really important conversation about people whose freedom has been lost. And let me just open uh, the conversation by borrowing some words from my, one of my favorite rabbis, Rabbi Amahai from Lab Shul, who said in his uh, solstice homily yesterday or the day before, he said, oi to the world. And I thought that was good, that was good. And then he said, let there be light despite. I thought that was good, that was good. In both of these comments, I found um, <laughs> what I need for this season. Uh, it's a season of joy, it's a season of peace, and it's boy joy. And here we are huddled again in hope. Here that word huddled again in hope comes from uh, the Reverend Howard Thurman, 
who wrote most meaningfully about Advent for a long time. So Huddled in Hope, we have these two wonderful guests who stay huddled in hope and then break out in hope on behalf of so many people. And I'm going to start by asking Vivian first and then Deanna to basically summarize what it is they're trying to do. You're, you're trying to get the captives free in my language, but what, what and how are you doing? So we all have a baseline of what you're doing. And then I'm going to ask you secondly, and you can go right into it if you want to, what's the best thing that could happen to the captives right now? What is your destination? Why do you get up in the morning and do this hard work? Vivian, you're first. I need to unmute you. Thank you to everyone uh, at, at Brooklyn Rail for inviting me to this important conversation. And thank you, Donna, um, uh, for the many years of service. And I'll get to all 35 books one day, but the ones <laughs> I've read have really inspired me. I. Um, I am always in a, uh, happy to be in a conversation with Deanna, who is, is a mentor to me when it comes to the specifics of public policy and just a heart for the grassroots um, community. You know, I, I do this work because I do believe in hope. Uh, and despite the circumstances that we find ourselves in, where we are in, in a country that hails itself out as a beacon of democracy for the rest of the world, um, hails itself out as a deeply spiritual and religious um, nation uh, okay. where uh, we identify with religion quite a bit and even sometimes almost cross that line between uh, religion and state. Um, we are not behaving in ways uh, that uh, emanate what I believe is at the foundation of most religious philosophies. And that is that every, every man is my brother, every woman is my sister, every human being is my companion in this world. And I should want nothing less for them, for them than I want for myself. Mm -hmm. So I do this work because I believe hope is required to do it. And many times we get bogged down in hopelessness mm -hmm. because we depend on the evidence that is around us. when the evidence says, oi, like, as, as you opened, but I don't rely on evidence. I, I rely on what I really think is fundamentally right. And I want to have a conversation um, uh, around that so we can come together. And for years, I, I believe that education was the key to that, which is why I ran college and community fellowship for so long, educating mm -hmm. women about issues that impacted their lives when it came to educational justice, criminal justice, healthcare justice, parenting justice, any kind of justice you can imagine. So that's why I do the work. Um, I'm continuing to do it now at the Columbia Justice Lab, uh, where I'm writing and thinking about a national conversation about the things we always sweep under the rug. And that mm -hmm. is a long and sustained conversation about this nation's history of structural violence and our history of structural racism. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And and I hear you loud and clear about the dehumanization of some people by other people. And I hear you loud and clear about the disconnect between the much uh, ballyhooed spirituality of a nation that has way too many jails that are way too full. So thank you. Loud and clear. Thank Diana. Thank you, Donna. Thank you. How about you? for having me always, as Vivian said, to be in conversation with her, but can echo everything Vivian said, um, focusing on my expertise coming from policy at Just Leadership. Just Leadership was founded on the premises that those most impacted by the system were missing from the conversation around policy changes or reform that is happening that directly impacts them and their lives. Um, as history has shown us, every other industry, field, mental health, substance abuse, veterans, women's affairs, when they're working on issues that help or benefit that community or individuals impacted, those individuals are at the table. But specifically for some reason in this country, when it comes to criminal justice, this we have been very reluctant of people who have been impacted by the criminal justice system 
to mm-hmm. sit at tables of leadership, to sit at tables of policy making, mm-hmm. and still want to say what's best for them. And mm-hmm. when it comes down to it, we still have, as Vivian said, structural policies, systemic policies, institutional policies that mm-hmm. allow for the dehumanization mm-hmm. of individuals right. who have been directly impacted by the criminal justice system. Right. So for me, um, I wake up every day with that fight of just wanting to kick those doors open, bring it blatantly right. to the forefront. I think right. the reforms we have been doing while they have been been welcomed and I feel we've been asking for crumbs. And if we don't go to the core, the root cause of racism, structural racism, we're going to always continue. What we saw last summer during the Black Lives Matter march, we were screaming the same things that the Civil Rights March were screaming for. So had we really made any progress, had we really made any progress. So that's this time is how do we keep our foot on the pedal? to make mm-hmm. real progress and disrupt the core of this system, which is our continuing mm-hmm. legacy of slavery and systemic racism. Mm-hmm. And I, I hear you saying loud and clear that we're spiritually hoarse, <laughs> we're just hoarse. <laughs> our voices hurt. And uh, we have programs like yours that address the structural things. I, I'm working with an elder right now who is, um, <laughs> I, I can't identify him too carefully, but he's about to get parole after 35 years in a New York State prison. And he's about to get out and he's got incredible bookkeeping skills. Uh, he was even doing the payroll for the volunteer, the, the men who worked in the jail where he was all those years. So he was trusted with New York State money <laughs> to give to people who worked these, you know, ridiculous 50 cent an hour jobs that they have in the jails. And uh, he cannot get a job, and I'm one of his referees, <laughs> because his prior comes up, right? So, I mean, what, what is that about? I mean, I call it punishmentalism, Vivian, instead of religion, uh, blame and shame instead of grace and good. Uh, but there it is, writ large. But give us a story about somebody you've worked with who, who uh, was, how shall I put it, uh, as interesting as my client and showcased the, uh, the systemic situations or go the opposite way, somebody who broke through, broke the wall down. You know, um... This is a good time where even my personal experience, having been incarcerated over 20 something years ago, having received a pardon from the governor of Ohio, when Mm -hmm. I was offered the job in DC or even New York City, whenever I Mm -hmm. moved to a new location, apply for housing, Mm -hmm. I cannot apply for housing through a managed property management because my record comes up. Right. In my hometown, I own property. I'm a landlord. I have a pardon. So if I'm 22 years removed, have the credit, have the income to sustain a basic human need of housing. What does someone recently release have that's coming up to all these, what we're calling assessment tools that even uh, property managements are using. Mm-hmm. Again, um, I have to be very specific. Um, specific in how I search for housing if I move to a new city to start a new opportunity because if I use a managed property management who does assessment and background check my criminal record comes up and it has stopped me right. and we're talking 22 years removed right how long oh lord how long <laughs> you know when do you get free right how do you get free and is it fair or is it not just punishing way too hard um so you know well vivian did you want to respond to that question about an example it absolutely is excessive punishment and i think um uh we who are are in the faith community are not um absolved uh many years ago uh, there was a book written called the protestant ethic and the spirit of project punishment yes Mm -hmm. um which really traces back the fundamental roots of punishment in our justice system to our our religious thinking our puritan thinking Mm -hmm. and um we've got to get beyond that and over it and i think in some places we are Mm -hmm. what's what's not necessarily happening is conversations where 
people are willing to be vulnerable enough to acknowledge the places where they have historically been part of the problem Mm -hmm. and take ownership of what actions they're going to do to no longer be part of the problem, but part of the solution. And that's Mm -hmm. on both sides. Yeah. Um, And I really believe that even the most progressive, the most radical, the most free thinking, um, abolitionist thinking people among us also have to understand that to have a conversation requires listening on both parts and the idea that compromise is not the same as giving up. Negotiating something that moves us a step further is not necessarily throwing it in the towel. What it is, it's trying to relieve suffering in the moment Mm -hmm. so that we can continue the work and relieve more suffering. It's about what we're trying to build, not what we're trying to tear down. Because if we just tear stuff down and don't build anything, um, then we're all in a worse position. Right, right. Well, and and what you were saying about um, uh, the structural impediments being so large and the, the steps to change it being so small, I... I love the slogan Black Lives Matter because it says Black Lives Matter. (laughs) And it goes to the fundamental dehumanization because how else could you have these, how else could you have these systems if you didn't think that Black lives didn't matter? Exactly. I mean, what would, if you thought Black Lives Matter, you couldn't do it. (laughs) So therefore, (laughs) what? What do you think? And I'm, I'm going to be provocative here. I was, um, I happen to be a bit of a fan of Eric Adams, our new mayor. And the reason is that I'm, a lot of my work right now is salvaging sacred sites, uh, buildings that are no longer in use for their fundamental purpose, but are about to go into gentrification. And Eric Adams happens to have been on that anti-development of sacred sites platform for a lot of a long time so i love that he's doing that but coming out the week of christmas <laughs> and being in in favor of solitary it's like how what why what is what is that about so it there's there's got to be some even internal may i say is it wrong for me to suggest internalized racism there i mean what how, what do I make of that kind of a move? So I'm going to take that just a little step further and then hand it over to Deanna, who understands mm-hmm. institutional operations way more than I do. Yes. Um, but I was more concerned about the reaction, the vitriolic reaction yesterday mm-hmm. to the city council. Yes. There was a tone in it that disturbed me. Mm -hmm. Um, And and I'm hoping that it's not indicative of the way he's going to respond to feedback and criticism. My very point is that if we can't learn to hear each other, to respond to criticism with ways that have been thought through, where we're analyzing data rather than saying, because I've done this, I know best. um, it, It sets up a tone that I don't think is about solutions. We can either fight a war and guess what? There are no solutions in war. Right. So we can, we can either fight a war or we can work together to find solutions. So that is a deep concern for me. And right, I'll, so- I'll let Deanna talk more about the specifics of solitary and- Yeah, okay, OCC. good. Thanks, Nick. Because some, some of our listeners may need a little background on what happened yesterday, but thank you. But please go, Deanna. No. Um- I definitely had the same concern as Vivian. And one of the things that just leadership, when we talk about a leadership, one of the concepts of leadership is being open to feedback, being open to feedback into Uh areas and information and expertise that I may have one lane of expertise, but we're talking about an issue that has a multitude lane of expertise that needs to be. So understanding institutional operation, understanding having been formerly incarcerated, having worked inside a correctional facility, having worked inside policy and administration, understanding Mm -hmm. from a law enforcement perspective that that's the only angle you have. You You don't have the angle of the science that talks about the human conditions of that, but you also don't have the understanding of working inside a correctional facility 
to understand policies and procedures and accountability that have to take place behind a wall as well, which yeah. all play together when you're making those type of decisions. One of the issues, um, this current administration pulled a task force together to come up with a plan to eliminate solitary confinement in the way we had known it of 23 right. hour lockdown. Right. Part of the process is there has to be a mechanism of accountability. Let's yeah. be honest, on Rikers Island with bail reform, that means the only people who are initially there are people who have been accused of a violent crime. Mm -hmm. Now we're talking about those people have then committed a violent act while mm -hmm. incarcerated as well. So what is the accountability tool? No, it shouldn't be dehumanizing 23 hours removed. But there has to, what is the accountability while we evaluate? Is it a mental health breakdown? Is it any of those other things that we can start instituting? But there again, the management of that system has to be in place. That yeah. plan was supposed to take place or go into effect December 31st. Right. This mayor has said he will shut it down on his yeah. first day in office. But there right. again, leadership is not about making decisions in a silo. Leadership is being open to feedback and working with the team of how did we get here? Why are we here? And why is this the best solution before we move forward? Yeah, yeah, that, well said. Well said, and it really uh, connects some of the themes we've been talking about. I don't know, did any of you ever see um, Herman's House, the film by Angad Bala? No. Uh, Herman was um, in Alabama, an Alabama jail for 35 years, and he spent his time, he made, uh, he made a picture of the house he wanted to live in when he got outside, and some people built it for him. Uh, it's a wonderful, wonderful uh, film, but he he spent a good bit of time in solitary, and so all of the rooms in the house were his kind of chosen solitaries. <laughs> so so, uh, so beautiful. I know because sometimes you know solitary is not a bad word, but it's to me it's now it's a curse word. You know, so dehumanizing. Uh, so, Deanna, can I ask you, when you were first speaking, you said, you, get, you reminded me of that slogan from uh, so many movements, nothing about us without us. How, how did you become someone who broke through? Uh, what, what, what happened? Who helped you? How did you help yourself? You know, when I was released in 99, part of my sentence from the judge was I suffered, I struggled with substance abuse issues. And part of my sentence was to no longer use drugs, um, yeah. get, regain custody of my children, yeah. stay stably employed, um, yes. stay crime free. Mm -hmm. Three of them were pretty good. Of course, my family gave me my kids back because they were like, here you go. Uh, <laughs> take your kids back. Um, Fine. housing was an issue because I needed stable employment to get the housing. So as I was searching for employment, I remember I had skills. I had taken vocational skills in high school. I did graduate high school and I would go to utilize those data entry skills at that time and would always get a job offer contingent on the background check. And I remember I started, I kept constantly getting turned down because of my background check. Um, which had changed the trajectory of my employability status. And yep. I remember I asked one lady at a financial institution, I said, can you show me the policy? And because everyone would say, our policy won't let us hire someone with a felony conviction. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. When I asked for the policy, there wasn't one. Oh, and I my realized God. immediately that employers were making decisions based on historical, whoever did it before them, who trained them. Wow. But it was blanket policies based on personal assumption and not company policy. So oh, I, started I, I started challenging corporations. Yeah. And then I found out a bigger issue, even around housing, public housing, they were saying it was a federal regulation that they couldn't give me housing and public housing according to my income. But I found out it was locally implemented. So I started challenging local policies and I realized Policies are the barriers to us being successful to reintegrate, but majority of the policies are locally implemented in our area and can be disbanded and disrupted locally if we find Wow. Them. You investigated the investigators. <laughs> right. 
<laughs> and Donna, let me connect the thread here because one of the threads that I think everything Deanna said is fundamentally a matter of the way we educate populations, especially populations who are not already living in communities that have the best school districts, that have access um, to yep. all of the resources because their income levels are lower, so less tax money goes into those schools and they just don't have uh, extra education like civic education. And the types of things that gave Deanna the sense to know, okay, there's a difference between local politics and state politics and federal politics, and I can navigate these systems. The, the exact thing that allowed me to literally, from day one when I was released from prison, make positive steps every single day was the fact that I had an excellent early childhood education because I happened to live in a school district where most of the residents were wealthy people. My family happened to be the people who cleaned up after them, but we, mm -hmm. but we all went to the same school. Got it. And because I had that, I was able to navigate systems. Mm -hmm. And not that the systems are right. Lots of things need to be changed about the systems, but education also plays a big part because how do you navigate them? And then once you figure out they're wrong, how do you change them? Yeah. And those of us who have done that can usually point to something in our early childhood that gave us a, a little bit of a head start, which <laughs> makes me even more passionate because I realized that of the 2 million, 2 million people who are incarcerated, most of them didn't get that head start. You know, and Vivian, I'm happy you said that because when you think about it, I, my childhood, I always went to Catholic, um, small Catholic schools in the community. Although we lived in an impoverished community, my mother really worked two jobs to send me to this Catholic school. And when I just even think about the Catholic education of how you actually have conversation in your classrooms, right? And when you're talking about civics or, or any other thing, you're really engaging in conversations to get clarity and ask for clarity in those conversations. But also I remember my class might've been 10 or 15 people. When I look at classes now in the urban cities, those second and third grade classes are 35, 40 kids with one teacher. So I even realized coming from that intimate setting in a smaller environment as well. Mm -hmm. So somebody gave you a head start. Uh, somebody, a system helped you, but then you had to go and help yourself. And that's a kind of, um, it's, a, it's a power. It, it's a power to ask questions of people who are over you. And uh, I don't know, I mean, I'm, I'm not much on willpower, okay? <laughs> I think there are a lot of people who have extraordinary amounts of willpower and still don't get, get anything. Uh, and that's the moral injury of these dehumanizing systems. Not every, I mean, I, I actually hate the heroic narrative uh, to tell well, you the truth, but I think yeah. it hurts. It, it absolutely does. And because what we're, this narrative of, you know, America is the land of opportunity. Right. Anybody who wants to make it in America can make it, you know, pull yourself up by your own bootstraps. Right. No one acknowledges that no one gives people a pair of boots to start with. Right. And, exactly. and so how do you pull yourself up by your own bootstraps? And I, I, I hate that narrative and the heroic narrative often, and there's, there's, there's also a flip side to the heroic narrative because it may look heroic many times to the public, but behind every heroic narrative, there is a story of you know, personal pain, suffering, invisibility. Um, you literally sacrifice, sacrifice your life sometimes for these movements. And there's so many other things that are lost along the way, but that's another conversation, which, um, you know, is the focus of my writing these days. Tell us about your writing. What are you writing? I'm currently working on a, on a memoir that is uh, about exactly that. Um, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. The, the working title is Still Broken, Life mm -hmm. in the Shadows of Criminal Justice Reform. Mm -hmm. uh, even those of us who are leaders in this movement, and I'm speaking specifically about Black women, mm -hmm. um, the things that we have to sacrifice, the the triple work that we have to put in, the struggles that we have raising resources to do the work, um, the second guessing of our 
uh, wisdom and impact yeah. um, takes its toll yeah. emotionally, physically, and in many other ways. And yeah, it's a so story that I think needs to be told. And I'm, I'm counting on my colleagues and friends that have, have been with me for years doing this work to be part of that story. Well, my beloved Judson Memorial Church, I can't say enough good about it, uh, but make sure you know it's not perfect. Uh, we had some very serious, um, what's the right word for it? You know, I want to say microaggression, but it was, it was more a kind of little stream of undercutting. So we had a lot of African-American women students who were breaking into seminary and, you know, this program. And one of them was a graduate of Oberlin. And one of our very fine members who was white uh, said to her, don't you find it hard being around all these smart people here at, at Judson? And it, it broke her heart. You see, now you might say, back to the heroic narrative, you might say, well, just get over it. You know, that was just one kind of stupid person saying that. And uh, it wasn't one stupid person saying that. It was showing the river for what it was underground where she wasn't going to be swimming. Because even though she was a, a Phi Beta Kappa, summa cum laude, graduate of Oberlin College, her education was not seen because of her color. And she helped, after that experience, she helped a lot of people see what that, um, what you're talking about, Vivian, the moral injury, the triple job, the... You know, I, I got this far and now you're still dragging me around by my ear. Yeah, it's, um, it's hard to explain. It's deeply painful and emotional and it is, it's invisible, which makes it even worse um, because you have, to put on, you have to put on the face, right? Um, right? In order to represent the issue. And then at some point you can't tell the difference between your own hopes, dreams and goals and the hopes, dreams, and goals of the movement. And that right. literally strips you of your individuality. It's, um, yeah, it's a tough topic and um, I'm struggling through it. Well, and I thank God you're writing it because I, that will help you and help us. Do you know what I mean? It, just to get it out, say it, and to find its truth. And, and I'm, I guess what, what I was trying to say by exposing something kind of, small and individual is that when that happens you get blame of the system and then you join it to blame of yourself for not overcoming and overcoming and overcoming and at a certain point you just can't overcome anymore you know it's it becomes too hard and i think a lot of people do give up when it becomes too hard and Thank God most of them come back in one way or another, but it does become too hard for some people sometimes. Oh yeah, I mean, there was a report, the New York Women's Foundation collaborated on a report about five years ago that talked about how many black women just walk away from the nonprofit world and never come back. Right. It was a very common occurrence. Very common. And it's not the great resignation or resignator uh, movement. It's a very different thing. It's like enough already. Yeah. Uh, but, but you need a support system, and I have one. And you know, Dana is part of that. And I think if it wasn't for those, like literally picking up the phone at two o'clock in the morning, and you know, hey, what you doing? I'm sitting on my bed working. It, we, we both are. Um, and you know, without understanding that there are other people out there doing the same thing, it, you, you're right. You could get lost in many different ways. I mean, this could have gone really badly, especially during COVID. You know, but um, yeah, it's not, it's not an individual problem. I think it's a problem we need to address collectively. Yes. Totally, totally agree with Vivian. And I think the most important factor is what she spoke about, having a support system, knowing mm -hmm. that we're not in this alone, but having those, that support mm -hmm. system where we can be vulnerable, where we mm -hmm. can say this is starting to be too much um, and just supporting each other in it. Because again, there is, it's a different game um, in the nonprofit world for African-American women. 
And not only just, I want to go a step further, African-American women who unapologetically speak their truth. Yes. Right. More. So you find yourself, do I lose my voice, my authentic voice and who I am mm-hmm. for the sake mm-hmm. of this nonprofit? Or do I move away so that the nonprofit can continue to flourish because I'm not willing to give up my voice? So literally mm-hmm. standing yep. in that, yes. I have to maintain who I am and be authentic mm-hmm. to self, but mm-hmm. it could harm and jeopardize my ability to support this organization and this movement that mm-hmm. I'm internationally. Yeah, and then the old slogan, inadequate as it is, the personal is the political comes to mind. Because the person is there in the politics, and the politics are there in the person, and they impact each other. And uh, I don't know why I've been arguing during COVID that people who run not for profits and advocacy work and clergy are essential workers too. And uh, as much heart as I have for nurses and doctors and people in the medical system who are overworked right now in a way that is despicable, because, you know, it didn't have to happen this way. It did not have to be this bad. This is called, you know, I'm I'm a big fan of suffering, but not unnecessary suffering. (laughs) (laughs) Right? It's not a thing. You know, good old fashioned suffering happens to everybody. You know, you die, you lose a lover, you something bad happens. But but making people work 12 to 15 hours a day because you want the freedom not to wear a mask is not working for me. Um, and uh, so that's the unnecessary suffering. So what, how we value people who keep going uh, through through these hard things. And sometimes I think you you value them by saying, please take a break. I mean, really, could you go on vacation, please? And come back whenever you're ready because the works you're doing is so important. We need you back. Um, now there's a question I see here about more of the day-to-day operations. Tell, tell me what your days are like in this endless work. Deanna, what are your days like? So definitely for me, the days part of Just Leadership, we run a year-long fellowship training program, which Uh directly impacted people of understanding their personal leadership styles, how they show Uh up. But my Uh day-to-day is being a part of making sure that the voices of people directly impacted are in the national conversation. So we have an association of prosecutors who are talking about prosecution um, diversion Uh and different things are directly impacted people are part of that conversation who understands policy. We're talking racial equity. Uh, so really pushing the envelope saying, hey, let's run a racial equity uh, hmm. table through the criminal justice from police, prosecutors, judges, adult probation and parole, but let the table be ran and controlled by directly impacted people who are the end users and customer service of all your services. Doing <laughs> very non-traditional um, conversations and showing the importance of our voices have to be included, even if you're talking about changing housing policy, how people access housing. There's a big push around second chance employment. That's yes. fine of giving people opportunities with criminal backgrounds, but do you know how to recruit? What is the culture within your organization that makes a person feel welcomed into your organization, not as a special token of a pe- person with a criminal background, but as a full employee who brings a, a level of knowledge, skills, and abilities to do the job. And making sure people, are, we're not asking for anything. We're just asking to be treated like humans and not be actually despaired by the various policies that actually take place. So really pushing the envelope of, this is not a stamp of, hey, we hire people with criminal backgrounds. No. Do you have a fair hiring policy that anybody can be treated right. as an employee who brings the knowledge, skills, and abilities, not another affirmative action program. I love it. <laughs> you know what? It reminds me of uh, medical students uh, who are male having to get, get, when they're training to be gynecologists, to put their feet up in the stirrups and take their pants down. It reminds me of that, and I love it. Uh, and I think that if you can have a way to learn from the people you're quote serving, you can get rid of a lot of crap really quickly. You know, the, the white savior complex, the, I mean, there's so many and helpers. It's not about 
helping. <laughs> it's about being helped mm -hmm. to see how we got into this mess that is so multi-generational, you know. Uh, Vivian, did you want to comment on, on that, how you spend your days? Well, you know, I, I spend my days trying to figure out how to <clears throat> push a conversation that acknowledges that we, we do need to pay attention to the to the, the hardcore facts and realities that are happening. Um, yep. and, 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 and then we need to tell the truth about them. But I, I believe in data, I believe in science, I believe in research, mm -hmm. but I also know that research is impacted, you know, who's, who's deciding what questions are gonna be asked, who's evaluating those questions and interpreting them. Mm -hmm. So at, at every stage, when we are doing research, especially around criminal justice issues, which is where we have decided to dump all of our social problems. Then Deanna right. uses this phrase, criminal justice is the catch basin of all of our social problems. Absolutely. So when we're looking at that data, are we looking at it in a purely quantitative way where we, we group numbers together and say, well, well, since most people are impacted in this way, this must be the problem. Instead uh -huh. of really tracing it back to what is going on on the ground in people's lives mm -hmm. that would help us qualify what mm -hmm. we do in ways that bring long-term solutions. And the solution is not necessarily to get these numbers down, to have yeah. more people employed in an entry-level job for 12 months or more, but it's really to impact the quality of life of the populations most affected in the long term. And they always happen to be people mm -hmm. who have been historically marginalized, sidelined, denied economic opportunity. Uh, there are direct links uh, in all of our justice systems to uh, slavery and the, the, the backlash of reconstruction, the whole police, policing system comes out of that era. And until we can have honest conversations about these things outside of the quantitative data, I don't think we're gonna get anywhere. And I'm trying to convince people that it's okay to have those conversations, we'll survive it. It's not mm -hmm. gonna be easy, but mm -hmm. if, just, if just a small percentage of people learn to understand that history, you know, we've got to win. We don't have to get everybody. We just have to right. get a few people. Right. And I think what you're saying about the uh, multi-generational economic trauma, in other words, steal the money and then you get it, you continue to steal it for all those years. I think what Black Lives Matter showed, the best thing it showed was the way the money didn't happen for some people and the way the money right. did happen and for other people, generation by generation. And you can't deny that. And, and Americans are very interested in money. <laughs> I don't know, but we, you can see it. And you know, and how did it become possible for you to buy that house and impossible for anybody, somebody else not to? Or take your roller coaster ride to space. I mean, you know, right. I mean, exactly. how, how can you live without that? <laughs> right, no, I hear you. And so when you say that the criminal justice system is the repository of all the messes, it's like so downstream and it's like, okay, we failed to educate you. We failed to, uh, we used you as a slave and then we failed to educate you. And then the mental health system failed you. Then the health system failed you, you know, blah, blah, blah. Now we'd like to put you in a system where you can't get out, which is going to fail you again. <laughs> because it's, it's, it's a way of blaming the person who was failed by the systems. And that's you're, what's so, so. You're so right uh, on that, Donna. We've been focused uh, on individual failure and not systemic failure, right? Correct. We've right. been focused on what the individual has not done without taking into account they were never set up to be successful by a system. Uh, anyway, but one of the things when we talk about criminal justice as the catch basin system, if we continue to focus on the catch basin system, we're saying we're gonna always need it. If we don't go upstream and say, no, we have to fix these systems so that we can decarcerate this system, we can reduce the impact of this system. We can't start looking at what the catch basin is. We gotta look at what's draining into the catch basin to actually eliminate the catch basin. The chair of my board in my second church in Amherst, Massachusetts was a, uh, the, owned a car dealership in Amherst, Massachusetts. And he said, 
he introduced himself once as a self-made man. And I said, Carl, you inherited the dealership from your father who inherited it from his father. And he said, no, 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 I'm a self-made man. And I said, no, 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 <laughs> if you inherit a business, you are not a self-made man. And we would go back and forth and back and forth. And he was mad at me for showing him the source of his income because he really, he believed he was a self-made man. And he wasn't. Mm -hmm. Is so, anybody? Is anybody, mm -hmm. right. Have you seen the GI Bill lately? You know, <laughs> uh, it's um. At any rate, um, see, I don't, I don't experience you all as being downers, and I'm not a downer. So once we recognize the depth of oppression, and and what you're saying, Deanna, about the the policies, the the catch of all these others, what where do you start? I mean, do you start with housing? Do you start with education? Do you, um, I mean, what are some really pregnant, beautiful policies that you think might get us someplace? So uh, there are definitely administrative policies of how we even define homelessness out of HUD will yeah. open a floodgate for people who are returning from correctional facilities to our communities. Yes. Um, having right. access to Medicaid upon release will have people having access to psychotropic right. medication. So there are some legit, I mean, administrative policies within the federal government that can actually where the rubber hits the road to actually. But when you say, where do we start? And this goes back to what Vivian talked about of how we're educated. I really mm -hmm. like to start with people who are directly impacted to make sure they have the correct information because we mm -hmm. have been living in a myth of We've always been told what we can't do with a fel felony conviction. Nobody right. ever taught us in the reentry process of what we can do, how That's we can it. disrupt a system. So I like to focus on ensuring while people are stepping into their greatness, while people are building their confidence to address issues, if they have the correct information, they got a shot. Mm -hmm. Because the first thing that the oppression is going to do is if you come to the table without the correct information, they're going to undermine you by proving that you're wrong and removing your expertise. Yep. Being a person directly impacted, you have to have the information when you step into that room, the information, mm -hmm. and as Vivian says, the data, the research that backs it up and what it does, it no longer walks into that table, that room of power. When yes. you step into that room with the correct information and your personal expertise, you have just leveled the playing field that you are as powerful as everyone else in that room and you are an expert stepping into that space and you own that space. Yeah. Mm -hmm. No longer a token. Exactly. Right. Um, because right. 20 years ago when I started out this work, the, the, the level of tokenism, it, it was just standard practice that the experts um, would, would get up and, and talk about whatever policy was being discussed and then at the end, there would be a three or four minute story of uh, which usually consisted of how horrible my life was until ABC organization saved me. Um, and so, so we, set, we set out to change that because um, that, 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 that narrative doesn't, it's, it's usually not completely true and it, it also doesn't work for anybody. So we needed a change in the way we were framing this work. Um, and a way to work together that that doesn't require um, the kind of dismissal of other people's opinions, even if we don't agree with them, even if they are flatly, I mean, and yes, some opinions are flatly dismissive of, dismissive of humanity. They, they're mean, they're, they're things that most of us wouldn't agree with, uh -huh. but there are some people who are on that line that we're gonna to have to work with because they're in control of systems that we're gonna to need to break down. You can't break down a system if they see you as the enemy on the other side of a battle line. Yep. So um, yeah, that's Very a different good. approach than most would take, but. Uh -huh. Well, and it's, I hear the writer talking too. It's a trueness to, you know, tell me what really happened. It wasn't because this fancy organization needs me to come give a testimony to raise their budget so these other people can help me out some more. You know, that's not the truth. Yeah. You, you were part of your own liberation and you were 
probably helped too. I was it's a both and very yeah. often. And and other people's minds I think have changed over the years because of it. I've seen things yes. happen in the last, you know, two or three years in terms of policy that were literally 20 years ago, people said, ah, oh, that would never, ever, ever happen. Like the restoration of Pell Grant eligibility to incarcerated students. Um, it was, one side was like, they don't deserve it. You know, they're incarcerated, they committed a crime, why give them free college? And the right. other side was like, we're abolitionists, why are you investing in the prison system? You're, you're right. part of the problem. So I'm like, yeah, okay, well, uh, I'm yeah, fighting right. to get Pell Grants back. So it took, uh -huh. 20, it took 20 years and a lot of other helpers and advocates. Um, but now we have a policy and I think a better understanding of why it's a good policy on both sides. Mm -hmm. But it mm -hmm. didn't happen overnight. Right. Yeah. yeah. Well, I've, I hear in both of you some really, really uh, fascinatingly well-informed systemic thinking. You know, and that's really helpful to me because I get kind of apoplectic. I, I thought we were really moving someplace on solitary and decarceration in New York State. I really did. I mean, it's been a gorgeous amount of work. And the early last year, I actually saw a lot of little things changing, bail reform. And then it kind of, I, don't, I didn't know if it was COVID or what, what was going on. Um, I mean, where do you think we are? Are we moving the movements to help free people um, who have been incarcerated? Where are they? What do you see? I think we continue to see the pendulum. It's like yeah. the okay. path that somebody pushes us back to read it. And that's kind uh -huh. of the bad part around the politics of this. Every time a new administration come in, if you've made two steps with the last one, right. the next one may swing you back to right. you, right? But you keep moving forward. I think um, for me, there's hope in education. There's uh -huh. hope in people say things, um, but then you may look at what are the various, who are they surrounding themselves with? Who's right. in the, your policy advisor and knowing that some of those people in the way that they think and uh -huh. hoping, um, the bad part about criminal justice are oppressive, marginalized communities. We're always in educating mode. We're always educating, sharing, and showing the dehumanization to continue to get the steps. And that's yep. why you try with every administration when you get a head start, like, can we get five steps? That way, if a new one comes back, we're only going to move back two. Then we can keep, actually start keep seeing some progress. But it's the nature of what we deal with until people see the humanizing of people who have been impacted by the criminal justice system. Right. It happened in mental health. It happened in substance abuse, right? Right. Let's think about it. Substance abuse during the crack era was criminal justice. It was the worst thing that could have happened. We had a war on drugs. Soon as it changed to opiate and the face of it and the color of it changed, it is now a public health issue. You can actually be caught on the ground with a needle in your arm be brought back to life and able to walk away. It right. has changed because the face of it has changed. And right. until we're in that point of now with criminal justice, where we're saying this is racist. We are actually, we have historical information of how you've criminalized us as black and Latina individuals, but the dehumanization of it. And that's the focus we have to. We can't keep talking criminal justice. We have to talk about the dehumanization of a certain class of people. Agreed, agreed. And the harm reduction <laughs> analysis uh, is really interesting, you know? Oh my God, all these white people are taking drugs. Let's do something about it. You know, you've got to have harm reduction uh, and uh, places to go. I mean, even churches are opening uh, <laughs> harm reduction centers. Uh, pharmacies are giving out Narcan. Uh, oh my God, I mean, is, is somebody, <laughs> at a party said, I don't know if I'm going to do any more marijuana because, you know, it could be laced with something. You know, that's how bad this whole drug thing is. And, and everybody was like, what, what? That's terrible. <laughs> but if you were to talk about uh, street users of drugs, for example, you wouldn't get any horrible. Yeah. It's like, you know, what's wrong with those people? Yeah, so the fundamental question then is how we're, we're not going to change hardcore bigots and racists no. into, into not being that. I mean, and it, 
<laughs> I'm not saying never. Occasionally it happens. It usually takes a miracle and it usually you know, takes a very personal experience to open someone's minds in that way. But I think we can change the way we articulate problems so that when we articulate them, we are always making it clear that certain communities are impacted more and there's, there's no reason for it other than racism or uh, genderism or ageism. To always make it clear that these policies are not equally distributed across all people. And we don't always do that. The more we do that, I think thinking people and people who are, who, who are not bigots and, and racist and choose to be that will say, oh, it never occurred to me. It never occurred to me that in, this impacted that community differently than it impacted mine. For, for me, that's the crowd I'm going after. Because eliminating racism um, is a problem, I think that's a little bit beyond um, my human capacity and, and maybe beyond the, the construct that we built in this country about race. And really, yeah. it's, it's a global problem, but it's very particular here in the United States. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. So much, so much. You know, one of the things I think the Deanna, I'd uh, love to hear more about the Just Us campaign because that I think is a very visual representation of, you know, how much we devalue the people who are incarcerated. And mostly because they're people who don't fit the, the model of the American dream, the middle-class working white family. They, they're people who are very marginalized, poor, immigrant, people of color, um, and because of that, there was absolutely no emergency management plan in prisons and jails across the country. And, and I, I think when you look at policy from that perspective, it also changes uh, how we do things. So Deanna, I'd love to hear more about Just Us. Yes, as Vivian talked about, we launched our Just Us campaign at the height of COVID. Everyone was calling for people to be released from from prisons and jails because there was no social distancing. They didn't have access to any uh, PE safety right. precautions or anything. But we went a step further and we started researching because while this was new to the country, we knew inside correctional facilities, we had been dealing with health scares of MRSA, um, right. you know, even the flu or different things of that nature. And right. with climate change, we had responses from hurricanes and different things of that. And what we realized when we started researching was that every public institution, every place that has congregate living has to, by law, have some type of emergency evacuation plan that protects the lives of the people who may be inside your building if a fire, a tornado, a hurricane, anything happens. Um, mm -hmm. Your college dorms have it. Your hospitals have it. If you work in corporate America, every now and then you did a fire drill. How do you get out if something happens? Well, right. we found out jails and prisons don't have to have that. Um, really? And it became evident, if you remember, <laughs> when we first launched it, the only thing we had for reference was Hurricane Katrina, which was 15 years ago. If you remember during Hurricane Katrina, they're evacuating the whole city, the whole state, but the parish jail took individuals incarcerated and set them on a bridge and prayed that the water did not rise. But the Humane Society had an evacuation plan for cats and dogs who you saw being airlifted out of New Orleans, but not human beings. Oh my God. Right. So right. as we started researching this, again, we found out there was no protocol in place, which is why governors and departments of corrections were not corresponding. You had people in the uh, facilities on Rikers Island. They were actually digging the unmarked graves for people to be buried, but there was no evacuation plan for them. If you remember in New York City, we ran out of hand sanitizer. Individuals on Rikers was making hand sanitizer, but it was a contraband for them to even use it to protect themselves because of this no protocol. So just us, we launched asking elect elected officials across the country to adopt emergency management style protocols that if something happens at a correctional facility, what is the plan that preserves the lives of the individuals who actually are remanded to the custody and care of the state who is now responsible for them once that judge sentenced them? It is the state's responsibility to make sure that they are safe. 
Then we had, right after we launched that campaign, if you guys remember, the Texas ice storms occurred. There was no plan. You couldn't get into the correctional facilities. There could not be food served. They actually allowed commissary to charge individuals who were incarcerated for pre-prepared pre food. Everyone didn't have money on their commissary. Everyone doesn't have support. So there again, there was no plan, even from the correctional facilities to say, if we cannot provide for the nutritional care, we're gonna put in this contract with our commissary provider that you will provide some type of supplementary food for every individual in this correctional facility, but there's no plan. So there again, there were people who had no funds or anything on their commissary to purchase food that literally had to go without food during that Texas ice storm because we have no plans in place. Senator Duckworth did launch a bill called the Federal Correctional Care Act asking mm -hmm. for states to be incentivized if they actually adopt some type of protocol so that we don't see the continuation that we're seeing. And now we have a new variant of COVID coming again. And again, correctional facilities, which were considered 1A in the first group of vaccines were moved to the end. So we still have correctional facilities who don't even have a vaccine yet let alone a booster. That's amazing. And who knew? I mean, but talk about evidence of uh, <laughs> inhumanity. All right, so I wonder if we wanna, uh, is there anything else I should ask you all? It's a little after two, and I wanna make sure you've got out all you wanna say about what you want to say. Um, I, I Just one comment for me, I, I feel Again, I am a big advocate of researchers. I work in a research lab. I read the research, understand it. But the general population um, in our country, um, they may understand a little bit of the research, but they make their decisions based on their gut, on how they feel about things. Uh -huh. Politics is driven by how people feel. Religion is driven by people, how they feel. And we've got to have conversations like this one, kitchen table conversations, where right. we're talking about the impact of public policy on real lives mm -hmm. so that people aren't bogged down with a lot of statistics and numbers that they don't understand, but they're understanding what could happen to their neighbor, their son, their cousin, their husband, if they get caught up in this system. It resonates so much more with people. So I appreciate um, having this type of kitchen table conversation in a public forum. Uh, where people aren't just looking to collect data, but looking to understand the impact on real lives. I agree with Vivian that it's really about humanizing the individuals who are directly impacted by the issues we're talking about. That these aren't just issues um, that don't have lives attached to them. There are definitely individuals who are directly impacted that are being dehumanized by policies. And we can look at it even if we look at the 13th Amendment uh, clause that still allows for slavery to exist, which actually is actually happening. The states are the biggest utilizers of that slavery because individuals who are incarcerated run the correctional facilities. But there again, looking at the policies we have in place that actually continues to dehumanize and devalue human beings. I want to... Um join in here. Uh, and firstly, thank you all so, so deeply. Um, Donna, Donna has stepped away from the kitchen table for just a moment to get her charger. But, <laughs> um, but, but I'll, you know, joke aside, I, um, it's, it's, it's a privilege to, to invite you both to this conversation and to this series and um, to hear about the work that you're doing. And um, I want to encourage everyone with some links in the chat um, to you know, go to Just Leadership USA, go to their website, uh, learn the many ways that you can support them in the Just Us campaign. Um, but it is our tradition to, uh, in, as we open it up, to pass the mic over to the Rails own Fong H. Bui, and uh, I'm gonna do just that. So Fong, I'm gonna pass you the mic now. Thank you, Nick, thank you, Nick. Thank you, thank you, Donna. Thank you, Deanna. Thank you so much, Vivian. Thank you so much. I, I think one of the conditions that we find ourselves when we are desperate is that we go back and we look the history. And I think that's what happened to this entire 
Trump administration and the pandemic, I want back very beginning rereading Alexis de Tocqueville, you know, Democracy in America and work way, way through Thoreau, Emerson, and all the best idealists uh, who really understood and tried to, um, you know, amplify the potential of democracy. And I, as I reread so many times over and over again recently, was Thoreau Civil Disobedience that was written in 1849. Um, and you know, previously he was put in jail for not having paid tax in Concord, Massachusetts, because he knew that money would go in to support institutional slavery and the declaration of war against Mexico. So when he was put in jail, you know, Emerson came in and visited him where he asked, what are you doing in there, David? And he said to uh, Emerson back, he said, well, what do you do now there, Henry? <laughs> you know, so the point was that it's famous in, in, that, in that essay where he said, let your life be the counter friction to stop the machine. What I have, have to do is to see that I do not lend myself to the wrong which I condemn, exactly what you were saying earlier, but you know, go to the fact that you have significant influence on Gandhi, Dr. King and other amazing social activists. And I just recently rereading Gandhi and came across with a very depressing remark, but also very illuminating to discover where Gandhi say, it's easier to wake up a person who was sleeping than it's impossible to wake up somebody who pretend to be sleeping. <sighs> you know, and that, that is so, in it's so true to the machine. When the machine create that, beautiful, perfect, you know, bureaucracy is no longer pay attention to the individual that need the support. And I think I'm involved with the studio in the school, you know, Aggie Guns, great uh, creation founded in 1977 when the budget was cut from our education system and create uh, that amazing institution. We rather call it living organism because at the moment, we're trying to bring across six different cities across the country and really employing working artists to teach children from underserved community, from pre-K to high school, because we believe that is when it counts. I just remember the whole dialogue in Congress when the Cold War ended. You know, the right is saying to the left, you take higher education, be it college, graduate school, and PhD, just leave us the pre-K and high school. It's <laughs> so interesting because I have to go back and start to rethink about United Daughters of Confederacy when it was found in, in Nashville in 18, what, 1894, 95, I don't remember, but the whole of motivation was so clear. Their aim was to pressure local government to make sure they erect and build monuments in towns and other public places. And the other is to control the textbook from children. So I only been to the South three times, frightened each time, you know, Diana, Vivian. I saw children reenacting Civil War episode. Only now I realized they were being brainwashed very from the very beginning. So my question is that the textbook is so important at this point, this point because we, we go back, it's like the, the Native American proverb say no river can return to its source, yet all river must have a beginning. And it reminded me so much of Toni Morrison, she says so many profound things, but one appropriate right now is that from early in chi our childhood, we all remember the phrase, once upon the time. And for some reason, we're not really focusing on the, the history, the, the textbook. In other words, the reason, one of the, the things that perpetual racism, misogyny, homophobia, bigotry, lack of science, 
because the education system is not including the beginning of our people. You know, we forgot to include the history of Native American who was the first slave, who land we sit on, live on, you know, and then there was, of course, we never thanked them, did we? <laughs> And then, and, the, and then the people of color were brought over, the African slave who built the White House of Congress and everything else under the sun. And then the Mexican who tilled the field, built railroad, the Chinese, that <laughs> go on and on, but it's not exist in the textbook. You know, so it's interesting to me where reading now, thinking about, you know, United Daughters of the Confederacy, they're very thorough about having that immersive total control textbook from pre-k to high school and i'm just curious in your own experiences i think i once had this conversation with donna we must find ways to somehow appeal to the congress that the textbook had to include all that early history would that help because i know that john dewey says something very important he said democracy must be reborn for every generation and its midwives is education. So if education doesn't have that early textbook, I, I think it will be perpetually difficult. What do you think, Diana? You know, I was smiling as you were saying that because education is correct, but it's, are you educating me on my truth? Are you giving me the illusion and educating me on what you want me to believe, which actually justifies the, the inhumane treatment of the way society is the way it is. And I think for me, what I'm starting to see as I watch just the pushback on the 1619 project being introduced right. into our schools to give us a correct, is that some people don't want us to know the truth because it would actually change mm -hmm. the trajectory of this power shift or this um, dynamic. But why is it a certain segment of population gets to determine what is learned, what is the truth for you based on their power and their stance. I, I struggle in this area. So I always lead a conversation around education to Vivian to help me because I really, it, if it's, just not, it's just racism of I need to stay in control, which is back in slavery. I even control what you think and what you have access to. Right. Right. Well, really, it is the foundations of the capitalist structure that in order to control, um, in order to have an organized democracy under the system of capitalism, you have to control the people and you control the people by controlling the money. Mm -hmm. And you control the money by controlling what people know and believe and how they're educated. And so it, it's no accident. It, it was not, a, they didn't just forget to put the history in the textbooks. It was like, it was an intentional decision to not put the history in the textbooks um, because then people would understand that freedom and democracy really means that everybody is free. And that even the concept that we, we value, we place this high, high, high value on work and career and, you know, so that, the idea that you should subvert yourself to another human being for the rest of your life in order to fulfill your happiness is fundamentally anti-democratic. Noam Chomsky talks about this all the time. Um, but you know, we don't teach this. We don't teach the deeper understandings of what freedom and democracy really mean. And you're right, we have got to have a mass movement to overtake our education system at that level, at the level of kindergarten through high school before people get to college because then you know you know some college students yeah it's 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 possible to to get them moving in another direction um but I'll, that also depends on what school they go to because now schools are even um you know getting polarized in terms of the the things that they want to teach and the the open-mindedness they want their students to embrace so Fong, thank you so much for for bringing that out it is a very important role but it's tied, it's very much tied to capitalism and that in order for our society to function where people put this high, high value on work more than their own freedom, yeah. um, you have to have that. You have to distort history in order to have that. Yeah, mm -hmm. thank you, Vivian. I mean, one thing that I always so invested now in the teaching of children, the, the, you know, Studio School or now it's called Studio Institute that we take the philosophy 
to a different city, but we don't impose our model on it. We try to encourage that culture should be built from ground up, you know? So that's what I mean. We kind of don't trust the idea of the model, quote unquote, so to speak. But what I'm trying to understand is that when children are learning, being taught about art, you know, whether they are making a, a you know, paper airplane or making a drawing of the sun or a landscape or urban city environment and whatnot, there's no discrimination between vocational study and academic training. They don't have discrimination of the two. For some reason, the emphasis on higher education is so strong and so exactly what former President Trump called social distancing. You know, where higher education you get, the more incredibly competitive you become. Uh, you don't get along with your colleague, which is a virtue of the perpetual leftist philosophy. We don't need to go into that entire <laughs> agony, but nevertheless, somehow I believe the beginning when children are young is the, the, the most important years to be able to, to support and train them. Uh, and I, I don't know where, where things are now, but I'm with you all. Uh, I'm <laughs> very hopeful. I'm very hopeful that, that this fracture of this that you know this fragility what we're going through now the experiment need to create the middle where all of us come together and shouldn't be associated with only the cultural elites and that's exactly what we're trying to do with the rail to keep it free and free that doesn't mean that it's not intelligible mm -hmm. or thoughtful so i'm, I'm super yeah. grateful to to you diana for your work to you vivian for your work and of course Donna is our most beloved and admiring editor at large. So we are grateful to you, Donna, as ever. So Good. Thank you. Back to you. Yeah. Let me uh, conclude then, unless there's any, anything else. Let me just conclude by saying that this last uh, conversation about education and the stories that were intentionally not told is really being exposed in this big new dust up about critical race theory. And don't think for a minute that that blew up accidentally. People thought, oh my God, if they start teaching that, people will know. You know? And then, oh my God, that'll be terrible. And I think in, in my family, when any of us have a fight with each other, uh, one of, we have a, a slogan, which is called OR, overreaction. So my husband will say to me, I think you're really OR here. You're just overreacting. Or I'll say to him the same thing. And it's a shorthand that says, hmm, you might be making something so big. I wonder why. Or, or as Shakespeare's, I think thou dost protest too much. That's too much. And that's exactly it. I think they're making a big mistake yes. by uh, overreacting to critical race theory, which is a simple thing. It just says race is more important in the history of our country than we thought. No, really? <laughs> and, uh, that, and that's just so true if you say it calmly. And, and if you put it, dress it all up in a, you know, they're destroying our children's minds or whatever. I mean, they make fools of themselves. And so now, mind you, I thought this all the way through Trump. I thought that at a certain point, he would finally say something so absurd that ordinary people would just say, that's it, you know, uh, disqualified, uh, I'm not listening to you. But that didn't happen. But I'm appreciative of what you said about Vivian, we don't need everybody. Uh, but if you can chip that percentage down and get rid of that microphone that they have, then I think we have a chance to return to our senses, our common senses about what's clear. Um, and I think it's pretty clear that people are people, that there aren't different categories of people, that one is not three fifths <laughs> or, you know, all of these things that have come up. And we might even be able to come to terms with our history 
if we knew it. And I think we, persistence is the key. And persistence is the key. Uh, or I call it, you know, having been an athlete for a long time, no longer, but I call it, you, you know, you, you lose nine times, you hit the ball in the net nine times, and then you come back and you hit the ball good the next nine times. And then you, you know, you, you have to be able to make mistakes along the way and not be killed by them. So persistence, huddled in hope, boy to the world. <laughs> Let there be light despite. I'm done. Thank you, people. All right. Um, thank you. Thank you so much, Donna. Um, thank you, Fong, for that question. And of course, thank you, Vivian and Deanna, for, um, for joining us today. And uh, I think it's important to take persistence with us after, here onward after this conversation. Um, but as is our tradition here at The Rail, we close all of our events, our community events with a poetry reading. And I'm very thrilled to welcome our poet laureate of the day, The Rail's very own poetry editor, Anselm Berrigan to our virtual stage. Poet Anselm Berrigan is the author of several books of poetry, including Something for Everybody, Come In Alone, Notes from Irrelevance, among many, many others. Uh, with Alice Notley and his brother Edmund Berrigan, he co-edited the collected poems of Ted Berrigan and the selected poems of Ted Berrigan. Berrigan was a New York State Foundation for the Arts Fellow in Poetry in 2007 and has received three grants from the Fund for Poetry. From 2003 to 2007, he served as Artistic Director of the Poetry Project at St. Mark's Church, and he is currently the beloved poetry editor here at The Rail. So without further ado, Anselm, over to you. Thanks. <clears throat> Thanks, Nick. Um, can everybody hear me okay? The, uh, the, the, the light changed coming through the window here that I'm sitting next to right when you said the word persistence uh, mm -hmm. just like 30 seconds ago. Um, th th thank you all so much for that conversation. Um, I actually want to read a, a, a few things by other people, and I might read um, one poem of my own. And um, th this poem first that was circulating, a friend of mine just post posted it on, on Instagram yesterday. It's a, it's a poem by Amiri Baraka called One Plus One Equals One. And uh, I'm going to read this first. One plus one equals one. Inside the music is like everywhere being everything. To tell a story is like that. Look at those eyes gone inside you, like the notes, unseen but alive, as what always will be. The eyes of everyone you've ever seen begin where the sound alerts us. And what opens is the front of ourselves, staring back from behind your feelings. Inside the music, it is everybody understanding what exists. The devil can't get in. And then um, the, the poet uh, John Keane, who's also a prose writer and is known, um, I think, more for his prose, and including his uh, book Counter Narratives. Um, which are fictional rewritings and short stories and novellas of uh, different moments in history, uh, has a book of poems that's just come out called Punks. And actually the title poem of that is in the current uh, poetry section of the current issue of The Rail. But in, in, in reading through Punks, I, I realized, I found a poem that he wrote that's after a poem of my father's, my, uh, Ted Berrigan, who, who Nick mentioned. I didn't know I was gonna be introduced. Um, and both poems are called 10 Things I Do Every Day. So my father wrote this poem called 10 Things I Do Every Day. He was really interested in list poems and he wrote this in the mid sixties. So this is his version, then I'll read uh, John Keane's version. 10 Things I Do Every Day by Ted Berrigan. Wake up, smoke pot, see the cat, love my wife, think of Frank, eat lunch, make noises, sing songs, go out, dig the streets, go home for dinner, 
read the post, make PB, two kids, grin, read books, see my friends, get pissed off, have a Pepsi, disappear. And then this is John Keane's 10 things I do every day. Floss my throat, watch my feet then glower, kiss Curtis at 7.30 to shake him, feed Kitty philosophical tenders, stroll the valley of dearth to journal square, keep the faith like a Benedictine under the Hudson, work like a yo-yo, nap like bear, address endless emails to forgotten writers, jack the meter to stand tall, drink lust as if it were spring water, walk through the muse when the coast is near, leave my friends in shadows, generous margins for error. This is, uh, I, I just wanna read a page from a long poem by Harriet Mullen called uh, Muse and Drudge. That's one of my favorite poems. This is page three, it's an 80 page poem. I dream a world and then what? My soul is resting, but my feet are tired. Half the night gone, I'm holding my own, some half forgotten tune, casual funk from a darker back room. Handful of gimme myself when I am real. How would you know if you've never tasted a ramble in brambles? The blacker, more sweeter, juicier pores sweat into blackberry tangles, going back native, natural country, wild briars. And then uh, just sort of listening to the conversation, I, I, I thought a little bit about um, Bob Kaufman's uh, jail poems, um, which he wrote in 1959 in San Francisco. And that's a, a longer poem, but I thought maybe I would read the first um, couple of sections from it also. One. I am sitting in a cell with a view of evil parallels, waiting thunder to splinter me into a thousand knees. It is not enough to be in one cage with oneself. I want to sit opposite every prisoner in every hole, doors roll and bang, every slam a finality bang. The junkie disappeared into a red noise, stoning out his hell. The odored wino congratulates himself on not smoking. Fingerprints left lying on black inky gravestones. Noises of pain seeping through steel walls crashing reach my own hurt. I become part of someone forever. Wild accents of criminals are sweeter to me than hum of cops. Busy battening down hatches of human souls. Cargo destined for ports of accusations. Harbors of guilt. What do policemen eat, Socrates? Still prisoner, old one. Two, painter, paint me a jail, mad watercolor cells. Poet, how old is suffering, write it in yellow lead. God, make me a sky on my glass ceiling. I need stars now to lead through this atmosphere of shrieks and private hells, entrances and exits in, out, up, down, the civic seesaw, hear me now, hear me now always here somehow. That poem goes on for about another 30 sections or so. And then um, the last thing I, I, I wanna read is, is a, a, a poem called The Maker of Wanting Space. It's a poem by a poet named Adam uh, Wolfond. And I, I, I know about this poem, it's not published anywhere that I know of, but I know about this poem because my friend, uh, Chris Martin, who's a poet in Minneapolis, does writing workshops with um, uh, children and teenagers and young adults who who have uh, autism or are on the spectrum in different ways, and gets gets um, ha has them writing poems, and then uh, has a newsletter that he sends out on on Friday um, that always has a poem in it. And this one came in in the last couple of years. I think Adam was. 15 or something when he wrote this. And it seemed like maybe a nice way to end the last uh, NSC. The maker of wanting space. 
I want to say that I want to amazing space think about the way I move to think. I game the space the way I open with the body and the way I think, which is the way of water. It touches me open and I am away with really easy feelings of dancing for the answering, really rare, always rallying, thinking, and it is rare with the way people think. Really a way of touching the world is the way I am wanting with my tics. I think that I want the way inside questions opening the want to the wanting way which thinks openly toward the water and I am thinking about it all the time. I think that I want the way inside questions opening the want to the wanting way which thinks openly toward the water and I am thinking about it all the time like eating words. Thank you, thanks for having me. Thank you for the conversation. Thank you so much, Anselm. Um, that was a beautiful way to, to conclude today's event. Um, very grateful to you, Anselm, and thank you so much, Vivian, Deanna, Donna. Um, I'd also once, once again, just like to thank Just Leadership USA for the vital work they do. And there are some links in the chat that you can um, check out to support that work. Um, we encourage everyone to view our archive of these conversations on our YouTube channel, uh, where we will upload today's conversation shortly. Over the next week, please join us for our holiday screening series. You can go to brooklynrail.org slash events to register for the many virtual screenings we have to offer until we return with our live program in the new year on Monday, January 3rd, for a conversation with Anna Conway and Ann C. Collins. Uh, but for now, I'm um, sharing gratitude with you all, wishing you all a very safe and happy holiday season and a healthy and inspiring new year. Um, you can now all turn on your microphones to say hello and happy holidays. So thank you all. Thank you so much for this experience. It's been wonderful. Happy holidays to everybody. Thanks, Anselm. Thank you. Beautiful. Thank you. Merry Christmas. Thank you, Merry Christmas. Thank you. Thank you, Anselm. Thank you so much. Happy holidays. Happy holidays. Happy holidays. Hey, everybody. Hey. Happy, happy holidays. holidays. Thank Thanks you, for joining Thank you, everyone. Oh, Thanks, Lynn. Thank you, Lynn. Thank you, GE. Thank you, Deanna. Thank you, Ama. Great job, Donna. Thank you. Great job, Donna. Thank you, Donna. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for the reading, and some. Yes. Reading. Beautiful. Yeah. Great Thank selection. You. Thank, Thank you, Anson. Bye, everybody. Take Bye, care. Donna. Much love and courage. Be safe. Looking for that book, Vivian. I'm working on it. <laughs> we'll keep our eyes posted. Me too. Take care, everybody. Bye bye. Bye, Vivian. Bye -bye. Thank you. Happy bye, holidays. Bye, Fong. Bye, G. Bye, Vivian. Hey. Bye, G. <laughs> Be safe. Bye, Take care. Watch Nick. Take care, Nick. Thank you. See you all. Crab oil. Crab oil. See you all in the new year. Had some good rest, Nicky Nick. Thank Thanks, you. Eleanor. See bye, you next year. Guys. Much love. <laughs> Ciao.